everyone. You're listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast. I am Jordan Hall, and as always, I am joined by the dynamic Joe Fordyce. Joe, the big news on this Wednesday, Cal Peterson placed on waivers, according to Elliot Freeman. I imagine the Flyers will announce that roster move soon, and presumably it's to clear way for Felix Sandstrom to come up and get a shot at being the backup. Joe, I had a feeling this was possibly in the works when John Tortorella said at Morning Skate on Tuesday that they were discussing their options. Uh, if you're discussing your backup goalie position and who could be the backup goalie, it means you're strongly thinking about making a change. How do you feel about the move? Are you surprised? Did you think it would take this long? Uh, what's your biggest takeaway here? Well, my biggest takeaway is the Pittsburgh game showed any team that's chasing the Flyers. If you can get in a spot where you can face the backup goaltender, you have a good chance to win. Yeah. I mean, they I don't want to say they weren't competitive because they were scoring, but they had to score at an unbelievable clip to even keep up. And that is not the recipe to hold on to a playoff spot. It's not the recipe to be competitive in a lot of games because Pittsburgh was struggling in that game. Pittsburgh played poorly in that game. And they were kind of a team leaking oil anyway. That type of play against a team like they played last night in Tampa or, you know, pick your teams, Detroit, Boston, the teams that are all in the playoff spots in the East, it it spells disaster. And you can't have that type of goaltending because regardless of how you play in front of them, the goaltender is probably going to do the exact opposite of giving you the chance to win, which is what you want. I think he's providing a chance to lose every game, no matter how you play in front. And that is, of course, the games that he has to play, where Arison is not, you know, in net. And But there's some back-to-backs. There's some big games coming up. I mean, you need to have a guy that is somewhat reliable in there. And uh, Peterson just was not that um, in recent games. So I, I thought it was a move that had to be coming. Um, I think we all knew when Carter Hart's situation creeped up and then he takes his leave of absence, all of a sudden now the cupboard becomes bare after Sam Harrison. And that's the biggest issue because before, no matter who was in there, you could expect to be in that game. And I don't think that's the case anymore. So now they're going to give Sandstrom a try. And I, I don't think they had any other choice. Um, and I don't think they're looking because of the the plans with the rebuild and, 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 the long-term plans of this team. I don't think this is a team in a position to go out and look to add a backup goaltender. Mm -hmm. They just, nothing about any of the messaging coming from this team says that is something that they're looking to give up an asset to get a backup goaltender for this season. So I think this is their, their best option right now. We talked about it on our last podcast that they really are not, I don't think looking to trade for a goalie, it, would go against exactly what they've been saying. They're not trying to give up assets for one run and giving up assets for a backup goalie is purely just supplementing this run. And, that. and you're going to have to overpay because now every yeah. team knows you're in a situation with your goaltending. Right. So, you know, your backup goaltender might cost you one and a half times what it might cost you any other season because teams know you have it or teams know you, you have a need. And I mean, let's face it. There's not that many teams that are, out of the playoff race. Yeah. So who is going to help you? I think that's a factor as well. And if you're not willing to give up much, if if you're trying to get a backup goalie, you're not going to get much better than probably what you have in-house. So it's really going to come down. I think Phil extends from the, getting the next shot here. The seven goals against Pittsburgh had to be what decided it for him. I mean, Peterson won his previous start before that. But if you give up seven, a crooked number like that in a division – you know, a rivalry game in the division that meant a lot. Uh, they probably saw enough there that they didn't feel confident he could be reliable and give them a chance. You don't have to be perfect, but you have to give them a chance. I don't envy his spot. That was a really challenging position for him to come into. That was his second start in over 100 days at the NHL level. I mean, it's a tough spot, but that's that's the life of a backup goalie, uh, that's his position. That's, that's his the job. life of the true backup goalie, like the goalie who backs up Andre Vasilevsky. Right. That's th that kind of workload, as opposed to what the Flyers had going on earlier this season where, you know, you're getting the game a week. You're getting, you know, 
you're getting far more regular playing time that you can count on. This is kind of like, um, all right, we have a back to back. Maybe I'll play. And otherwise I'm just going to practice. And it's, it's really, it, I think it's tough for anybody to keep that kind of schedule in play. So that's, you know, that's what happens. I mean, you know, you don't want to sit here and bash Cal Peterson, and I'm sure the schedule has to is a major factor here. So, because as you said, it's not like he hasn't played any good games this year, but when you're playing so sporadically, and then you're thrown into this big time division game on the road, off a loss to the Rangers, and you know your team really needs you, mm-hmm. it's a lot of pressure when you're staring down. Crosby and Malkin and regardless of how the Penguins are playing those guys are still on the team and it it just that had to be the the breaking point had to be and it's hard to believe Joe's Felix Sandstrom is 27 years old now and perhaps uh what went into this is that Kim Dillaball has worked with him a bunch the goaltending coach for the Flyers he was a 2015 draft pick so Dillaball knows him well and while he has struggled up here at the NHL level and he hasn't really done a ton this season at the AHL level, his numbers don't jump out of you. They do know him, and they, there is a history there. And perhaps they just feel like they, he can give them more than what Peterson was giving them. I do feel like I've seen glimpses of Sam Sherman where I think he's real common net, and he makes a key save from time to time, and then he gives up one that he has to stop. Uh, so I, I, I think Sam, I, I don't hate it. I think Sandstrom deserves a chance. Why not? I don't, I don't think uh, they can go anywhere else at this point. So how do you feel about Sandstrom's chances here to come up and spell Erickson from the time time to time and give them a, a shot here? Well, I like that they're bringing up a guy that has NHL experience, and he has NHL experience being a backup to a number one goaltender with this franchise. So there's a lot of guys that are playing in front of him that already know his playing style. Mm-hmm. They know his practice style. Um, like you said, they've worked with him. So this is not an unknown quantity. And I feel like in some ways Cal Peterson was that. Um, so now Sandstrom gets his opportunity and I mean, put it this way, I would rather have Sandstrom than just grabbing somebody that's available or, and, and having them come into a new system and, and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, you go with the known quantity at this point in time, especially in a position like the flyers are in right now. And, you know, I, I, I think this is, this is the best move given where they are and what they have to work with. And we do believe it will be Felix Sandstrom, unless the Flyers have something up their sleeves. Uh, we don't think so. It All signs point to it being Sandstrom. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the Flyers have a busy, busy March. It's 15 games in this month of March. Two of them back-to-back sets. Uh, I believe they have three back-to-back sets left in the season. So they're going to need the backup. Tortorella even said it the other day. He thinks he's going to need his backup goalie maybe four to five times coming up here. So these are important games for the Flyers. They can't overwork Arison, Joe. I think that's still an emphasis is that this kid is still a rookie. He battled injuries in 2021-22, his first year pro in North America. You don't want to overwork him. Uh, they're going to need him, but you, I, I think they have to make sure they don't overwork him uh, because if he deals with something, suddenly they're in an awful yeah. spot. Yeah, if he, were to, he, if he were to develop some sort of nagging situation, then – things are in in dire mode at that point because then you don't have a starting goalie. Right. Um, Because I think what we do know about Sandstrom is he is not a starting goalie in the NHL. Mm -hmm. He's serviceable as a backup, but really beyond that, where where are we looking? We don't even know where we were talking before this pot. We don't even know where the Phantoms are going. Right. So we certainly don't have another answer for the Flyers um, going forward. Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on Open Table. Joe, the Flyers did get a big win on Tuesday night. A much-needed win over the Lightning, 6-2. A couple empty net goals, but a huge third period. They broke a 1-1 tie with three straight goals on Andre Vasilevsky. They really, really needed that win. But in that game was a very, very weird thing, Joe. The lights going out. Partial power outage at the Wells Fargo Center. Phil Laws, the president of the arena, spoke at first intermission. And he said that a transformer blew at the event level. No one was hurt, but it did cause lighting to go out and 
There was no music. Lou Nolan, the public address announcer, could not talk on the mic. You guys were affected this by this in studio for pre and post game live. Just give us a glimpse of what you went into, what, yeah. what you went through. So here in our newsroom, the house lights went out. The TV stayed on. But immediately we were told the studio, the lights are out. Our monitors are out. It's basically unusable <laughs> as it was at that point. So at that time, we went downstairs to the location where Ashlyn does the between the period interviews. It's uh, like a staging area. We go down to there. They have no monitor, so we can't see the game. So we ended up standing in the Zamboni tunnel there where they shovel the loose ice off during breaks. And we're standing there basically getting out of the way while they're shoveling snow to have a place to watch the game. And it was just bizarre with no music, it was. the scoreboard. You, all you're hearing is the pucks hitting sticks, mm -hmm. um, guys yelling to each other. Um, you, you did hear that sort of hum of fans, like what is going on type of thing. And for a good period there too, the Wi-Fi, the LTE, everything was out. Nobody could use phones. It was like, um, it was kind of like one of these uh, nightmare scenarios when people you know, talk about like when the bots get us, this is what's going to happen, you know, and nothing works. There's no power. Yeah. And I was quite frankly amazed they kept playing. Now we heard John Tortorella's interest, interesting explanation after the game as to why they kept playing. Um, and basically his point was they were up on nothing. We're going to keep playing. Don't care. If Sam Harrison. Can't he didn't see care. The yeah. Yeah. But here's what, here's what I'll say about this. I think that that whole unique circumstance help the flyers i really think it did because i think it had a major effect on andre vasilevsky he was he looked like he was on another planet last night i was blown away at the goal the i mean look, he gave the up goal, in the third period the forrester goal it's a great move it but is. it's still a backhander short side it's not screened it's not tipped and he lets it in on the near on the near side post this is not what you see from andre vasilevsky he's mm -hmm. arguably and maybe not arguably the best goalie in the nhl for the last six, seven years, mm -hmm. you don't see that kind of goal. The first goal he gave up was even before the power went out and Bobby Brink, that was a goal that went under his arm. Yeah. So I think that combined with the power outage and just all the weird circumstances and then the lights come back on, it kind of, um, and, and, and John Tortorella alluded to this, how it was weird for both teams. Both teams couldn't really get started because I mean, the end of the first period ends because officials are pounding on the glass from the penalty box to let the refs know on the ice that the period expired. Mm -hmm. There's no clock in the building. Yeah. I mean, I had never seen it before. Definitely one of the more unique circumstances I ever worked in. I can't imagine playing in it. Now, I mean, the corners look pretty dark to me. Being down there in one of the corners, it seemed pretty dark. Um, so, I mean, the guys played it off like nothing afterwards, but... um. I'm not sure the lightning guys would have played it off as nothing afterwards. And I didn't hear what they said, but I'm guessing they didn't think it was nothing because um, I think it completely took them out of their game. It was, it was an odd break in the game and there was just no juice in the building at that time too. When they resumed play, Tortorello said officials after there was about a nine minute delay. The game stopped at like 716, restarted at 725. They did use some of that time as like clear off the ice, almost as what they would do in the TV timeout or a stoppage. But there was a delay, and they said officials talked to both coaches, John Cooper, John Tortorella. Both coaches said, We're we're good to go, but let's check with our goalies, and the goalies okayed it. But yeah, it was just so weird to see Vasilevsky that off his game. I don't want to discredit what the Flyers did. I mean, listen, they got after him a little bit. But he did allow some goals that we don't see him typically give up. Tortorella even said the Forrester goal was one that he typically sees Vasilevsky stop. And then suddenly the Flyers are up 2-1 early in the third period. They've got momentum. And then it kind of just snowballed on it, Vasilevsky. It's it so snowballed. And, and the other thing, too, is um, that made this weird was John Cooper pulling the goalie with over seven minutes left in the game. Yeah, And you're sitting there and it's like, is this – is he waving the white flag? Is he trying to get something going? You can't ask your team to hold up without a goalie for seven minutes. Yeah. Um, and the Flyers end up getting two empty netters. Uh, one, of course, after Stamco scored. <laughs> um, but it, just a really, really odd night for a number of different reasons. The power being most of it. <laughs> the Vasilevsky part is a huge part. And then to me, when you see a, a coach pull a goalie with seven minutes left. Yeah, I think it was over um, nine. 
I think was it, it over was, nine? It was okay. nine plus. <laughs> I think Stamkos might have scored at like around the six or seven mark. Yeah. Well, I, I know I what tipped me off was it I saw the empty net thing come down on the graphic yes. on the TV. Yep. Yeah. And I'm looking and I'm like, that's gotta be a mistake. Because I don't think it had been referenced yet by Jim Jackson or yeah. Bush. And I was like, that that has to be. And then I'm like, what? what's what is this? And a lot of us couldn't what see the clock. What is this coaching style? Yeah, a lot of us couldn't see the clock in the arena. Because the scoreboard remained off for the remainder of the game, they had the jumbotron off. I don't know if that was because that that just creates so much electricity and it needs so much that they like let's not mess with this. Yeah, um, but we couldn't see the clock, so we were all thinking like, "Wow, really? Like four minutes left?" We're like, "No, wow, there's there's like seven to nine minutes left." And there's, I guess, a last ditch effort when you have talented guys like the Tampa Bay team. Does. Yeah, and of course we see them generate a goal right away. Yeah, but then the Flyers put another one in. You can only you can only ask. For them to hold up that long, yeah. Now, and I'm not sitting here. I'm not. John Cooper's one of Stanley Cups. Yeah, he's he's, he's one of the better coaches in this league. Mm -hmm. But that was a coaching style that I don't think I've ever seen before. Yeah, you don't. I mean, that. we're starting to see coaches be more aggressive with the three minutes and, mm -hmm. and even closer to four, seven plus, eight plus. This is not what we you know want to write. You're talking about half the period, and that's yeah, unorthodox. <laughs> let's say that indeed. And the two empty net goals gave the Flyers six in back-to-back -back games. So we saw that crazy game in Pittsburgh on Sunday, seven to six loss, six again against the Lightning, benefited by two empty net goals. That's 12 goals, Joe, without Travis Konechny, their leading scorer. Can they keep this up? Uh, Konechny right now is still listed as day-to-day, -day, but there does seem to be some concern. He's missed three straight games. Very important player for them, as we all know. Can they get offense from different people to keep this going well so what i've seen from forrester is since he came back from his injury he he looks like a different player in the sense that we saw glimpses of what we've seen regularly for the last three games mm -hmm. before he got injured now we're seeing it consistently we're seeing him break down the defense and make plays for other guys we're seeing him obviously score in a bunch of different ways so if we're if you're getting that version of Tyson Forrester, I think they can keep scoring. You're getting Sanheim all of a sudden very m much involved in the in the offense the last few games. Um, so if that remains consistent, I I think they can, and I think that the building of the momentum of we're picking up for Travis, and it's not a lot of um, well Travis isn't here. Who's the guy we go to? I I think focusing on who is scoring and not the guy that's not there helps that. And, you know, it's worked in the past few games. And, uh, you know, I I don't want to say I, I can't see it stopping because I can. Um, it's not like uh, we've seen a ton of offense generated from guys like Noah Cates. John Tortorella had Sean Couturier in the fourth line last night. Obviously, I don't think he's terribly thrilled with the amount of offense that Coots is generating. So, I think if you can continue to get pieces from everywhere in the lineup, from the D, from the forwards, from the top and bottom six forwards, Lawton, Lawton very involved offensively the past few games, um, I think they can keep it up. I don't think they're going to keep it up at six goals a clip for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you're going to have a – to me, you Friday's game – you're going to tell, you'll be able to tell. It's a road game. It's a team uh, that's in striking distance of you. They need that game because you could probably bury them if you win that game head-to-head -head in their building. So I think we'll see a lot on, on Friday in Washington um, in terms of how much of this these offensive outbursts were about their opponents and or about them. Mm. And, uh, and who knows? I mean, Konechny could be back, but I don't think we're counting on that at this point for Friday. Yeah, exactly. Can't count on that until you see it. And back to back this weekend where we should be seeing potentially a new backup goalie. Joe, I feel like this is a weird benefit of a rebuild is down the stretch. You get young players who quite frankly, just have not played as much hockey as older veteran guys. Maybe their bodies have a little less from the history of playing so many years and you see them kind of take off. They actually get to another level. We saw it last year. Morgan Frost took off as the game's ramped up. Owen Tippett, same thing, took off. Noah Cates got better 
as the games wore on. And I feel like we're seeing that right now. You're seeing some young players that just have younger legs. And quite honestly, they just don't they don't know any better of like this being a playoff race or these games being big. They just go out and play. And we're seeing it with Forrester. We're seeing it with Frost right now playing better. Cates is picking things up. Tippett, of course, has a chance to set career highs. So weirdly, I just think that's a benefit of being in a rebuild. You have a lot of young players with not a ton of experience, and they just go out and they play. I also think there's another element to this in the sense that I think there is a house money element a little bit with this team. Absolutely. The, the season, if it stopped right now, I think the week, that everyone would consider it a success and not only a success, yep. more than a success. So there's that you're playing for something in addition. So it's all, it's, you've already done way more than people thought. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not saying these guys are ha satisfied with it in any sense, but I feel like it's a little like, let's just kind of let it all hang out and see yeah. what, see what happens when we're out on the ice because They've already surpassed expectations. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. I mean, they could lose every game for the rest of the season, and they've already surpassed yeah. expectations. They've already matched last season's win total. Yeah. So I, th I think, I think that has, that is a, a mentality, um, that they've played with for a lot of this year. Once they got some success going, um, they don't have a superstar, uh, so you're not. There's, I wouldn't say there's anybody on this team where you're like, well, well, we're still waiting for this guy to live up to his expectations for this particular season. Mm -hmm. I think that's already happened. And now we'll just see what happens for the last 22 games. Because that's what's really opened my eyes over the last two, three games is the Flyers' big names up front. One, Konechny hasn't played. Couturier's fallen off a little bit. I think he's going to stabilize, but he has not been there the way we've seen him be there. And... He was playing fourth line minutes last night. And then Cam Atkinson is a healthy scratch last night. So three veteran forwards that you thought were really going to have to be there for them haven't. And you're seeing young players just go out there and open your eyes. And uh, sometimes you get that with, with youthful experience. <laughs> they don't know any better. And also what you said, excellent point. It's house money. I think the expectations aren't really quite there. They're, they're excited to be in a playoff push and they're just going out and playing. And you see them beat a Lightning team with just name after name after name. Um, that was impressive. That was good for them. I think that's going to be good for their psyche going into the final 22 games here. Uh, so without a doubt, I, I would liken this a little bit to the feeling, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna couch this early 90s when when the okay. Flyers got Eric Lindros. They obviously had a superstar coming, a centerpiece. This mm -hmm. team doesn't have that, but in the sense, the feel around the built the building's full. Mm -hmm. When you talk to people about the team, they fully acknowledge this team. They know they're not there yet, but they're optimistic about where they are in the near future. Mm. And I feel like that's what happened in the early 90s when Lindros got here. The Flyers hadn't made the playoffs for five straight years, but there was a sense of we're ready to turn the corner. Mm. We're, we're right on the brink of being, you know, not even necessarily contenders, but we're right on the brink of being in the mix. And really, I think that's what this fan base is, what they ask for. They were asking for a, a rebuild, a kind of tear it down and start this thing over. Let's, you know, get out from some of these bad contracts. And the, the Flyers have done that. And now it's about what's next. And when you talk to people, you do get the sense they're a little apprehensive about getting too excited about this team. But they're also, there's also this, I can't believe it happened this fast. Even when Ashland, we, we were at the stadium series game two weeks ago. And when Ashland talked to commissioner Gary Bettman, he talked about how great it is to see a, see the team turn around hmm. in short order, a, a very important team for this league. Hmm. Um, you know, part of that second six group of teams, they're a very important team to the NHL and they're an important hockey market. And I think there's a little bit of that feel, of course, minus the generational superstar that was Lindros. Yeah. But in terms of the way that people are talking and buzzing about the team, I do feel like there's some similarities to that feel. And I still feel like there's 
the majority of fans that are not saying bye bye bye. They're saying, "Hey, I'm okay if you guys sell off a couple pieces." Like they understand. Yeah, that. I wonder how that reaction is going to go because there was yeah. a lot. Like Sean Walker played last night, so of course that starts making you think, "Can they get a one for this guy?" And and I don't know if it's going to be a rude awakening if they add nothing next Friday mm -hmm. and subtract some pieces. Or it's going to be like, okay, well, this is what they said they were going to do. Because it is what they said they were going to do. Yeah. The messaging hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. It's been consistent. So I'm interested in the reaction to the trade deadline. Because I think when you see what happens, um, you're really going to know exactly where this team is after next Friday. Indeed. This has all created kind of a fascinating storyline for the trade deadline and for the rest of this season. No one really expected them to be in this position. Here they are. And it's kind of been fun to follow, watch. Uh, it's not, Joe, it's refreshing to have meaningful games this time of year. Um, so we'll have it all covered here on the Flyers Talk podcast. Back to back on NBC Sports Philadelphia, right, Joe? Absolutely. Yeah, Friday, yep, Saturday. Post, we'll have on uh, Friday and Saturday. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Joe, thank you so much. Great to see you. Great to chat with you. A big thank you to Ben Berry, our podcast producer and guru. And Flyers fans, of course, as always, thank you so much for listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, please rate and listen. And we cannot wait to talk to you next time.